further ado, I'll introduce Lindsay McDonald from the University of Canterbury, who's talking on research ethics review and Indigenous peoples. Over to you, Lindsay. Kia ora, Andrew. Tēnā koutou, koumou takuri taku maonga ko rakuhuri taku waha wawa ko takutimu taku waka kwa kai tahu taku iwi ko hini matua taku hapu ko maho nui rua taku marae no ta tahi o kai wa wai makarere taku kainga e nei nei ko Lindsay Teatro tu McDonald taku ingoa. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and to um, the others who have come online, thank you very much. Um, I hope I can deliver value to you about New Zealand. And so first of all, I'll just um, stick up the obligatory um, photo of Jacinda, but I think this is a really good symbol of research ethics, uh, Te Roa style, and I'll, by the end, I'm hoping to convince you that in some ways, Jacinda is a symbol or metaphor for how we are trying to approach research ethics involving Māori in New Zealand. Um, obviously, sometimes we don't live up to those expectations. Um, and I'll try and tell you a bit about how we got here um, and some practical thoughts from me as a former chair of a, a university um, ethics committee about um, how we implement the kind of principles that have started to become um, or are obliging institutions to think about research involving Māori and the ethics of it. So what I'd like to do is give a quick overview of the legal and policy frames which de delivered the results. Um, that mean today most research in New Zealand has, has, its, has had its, its kicked by someone who's aware of Māori concerns about research. I take quite a different view from some in that as a former advisor in the Ministry of Māori Development, and um, a public servant and later a political theorist, I tend to view Crown Māori relationships, that's Crown government um, Māori relationships as a series of diplomatic encounters between the Crown and the tribes or what I call iwi and the sub-tribes or hapu and between the Crown's organisations like universities or statutory ethics committees with the various political entities that represent Māori. I think it's really important to note at the start that the relationships are diverse and, multi and multitudinous and Māori entities themselves are quite often quite opaque. Um, so that diplomatic relationship takes careful and sophisticated management. And I'm hoping to show you why that management has to occur in the New Zealand context. Um, research involving Indigenous peoples, therefore, as I suggest, a risk management strategy. Um, and while some people don't like me framing it this way, I'm supposed to frame it as sort of, you know, nice of being nice to Indigenous peoples or the fact that since all Indigenous peoples like me are tree huggers, we have to have environmental concerns or some other such um, cultural determinism. I think for many researchers and research ethics committees, it becomes much easier to understand what they're meant to do around research involving Māori if it's framed as research risk management and hopefully as I go through you'll understand my point. But I'd first like to make a little aside of when I say Māori I'd like you not to think of a group of Māori people or even a Māori individual. I don't want Māori to be a cipher for all of the othering that is so easy to do in our heads when we're talking about race. Um, instead I mean the organisations that represent that represent or even purport to represent Māori. So I'm not talking about an ethnicity, but a diverse multi-vocal community that happens to all share whakapapa or family links to the original settlers of New Zealand. So I'll typically say Māori, iwi, hapu and whānau, that's Māori tribes, their sub-tribes and wider families. And if I don't say that, that's what I mean to say, plus all of the urban Māori authorities, plus all of the local health providers, and on and on. Within that context, I want to explain what a particular frame for looking at Indigenous peoples involved in um, research and how I come to practically and review applications involving Māori. Um, the overall reason for all of this, and here I speak as a political scientist, is that Māori 
are a sizable voting block, which has forced accommodations on the basis of Māori claims and law and policy, since, especially since the 1980s. Um, and it means that we have over 30 years of commentary in the courts and in various government institutions and in scholarly writings about government organisations missing the apostrophe, damn, um, responsibilities towards Māori individuals, iwi and hapu, and whānau. To give you an idea, um, the estimate based on census last year is that there'll be 850,000 or so Māori, um, that's 16% of the national population. Um, as you can see, the settlement for um, iwi across New Zealand, the South Island's not there because the whole thing is settled under the Naitahu claim, um, are almost through, which has given Māori a sizable asset base. At the moment, they're talking about the asset base alone being worth 50 billion. That's in a context, and this makes us seem rather small, I must admit, of a New Zealand budget of around 80 billion a year. So you can imagine that the investment potential of Māori is quite hard uh, um, or quite sizable within the overall um, scheme of New Zealand economy. I'd always like to show at this point that um, while Australians in particular can think it's because of the treaty, um, the Crown made long-standing promises um, and acknowledge those promises to Māori so that you can see in 1839 with the sent to the person that was bringing the treaty to um, New Zealand, the effectively the Minister of um, Colonial and War Affairs told that little captain that the Crown, the very British Crown in 1840, almost as strong as it was going to get, acknowledges the New Zealand New Zealand as a sovereign and independent state. And so that's the historical trajectory, or our historical trajectory arises from those kind of statements by the Crown. Settlers undermine that, but it's important to see that as the Crown emerges um, into, into its relationship with Māori in the 1980s, the historical background is one of actually trying to treat diplomatically with Māori and to honour their rangatiratanga or their self-determination. Um, because of the 40 years or 30, 30 to 40 years of treaty legislation, the treaty is now regarded, and this is from the Cabinet Office Manual, a key part of our constitution, our um, convention within constitution, is regarded as founding document. Um, and we go back to the treaty for a variety of reasons. Um, because it got written into law in the 1980s. It was inserted into multiple statutes. In this instance, as a duty of university councils, which we'll come back to later, um, to acknowledge the principles of the treaty. Um, and many other statutes, for instance, in the Conservation Act, the department has to have regard or give uh, meaning to the treaty and all its policies and practices. Um, so, some scholars have talked about the embedding of indigeneity into um, our system of governance. Um, at the same time, a political commission of inquiry, a statutory commission, was created to investigate then contemporary breaches of the treaty. And um, a little bit later, uh, 1984, it was given powers to look back to late portal. And this all means that the treaty can be used or the parts of the treaty can be used as a tool of legal and political accountability. On the treaty um, statutory clauses, any individual can ask the High Court to review actions. On the Waitangi Tribunal, the, the Political Commission of Inquiry, any Māori can ask the Waitangi Tribunal to do a report on an issue where a government organisation is breaching the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. I myself have a claim under the, on health disparities and um, for anybody at universities, um, you may get a laugh out of the fact that many times I've felt like doing a, um, a claim against university for its management of indigenous peoples. Um, 
All of which means that managing relationships with Māori is critical to avoiding organisations um, becoming front page news for failing to abide by statutory obligations or, um, or to end up in front of the Waitangi Tribunal talking about why their policies and practices haven't lived up to um, um, their promises and policies and documents and or their statutory obligations um, under the treaty, under their own statutes. Now, just before I get into what this all means for ethics, just a quick reminder, we don't have a national ethics statement, not for lack of trying. Um, there are statutory health and disability ethics committees, but they have quite a narrow scope. Um, blood and guts is probably the best way to describe their scope, um, but they can go wider. Um, we have statutory animal ethics regime, but no other research is covered by a national statement. Um, the Royal Society might beg to differ, but given their recent upgrade of their code of conduct, um, I will disagree. Um, the universities and government agencies, for instance, Crown Research Institutes, um, create their own ethics committees, have their own policies, and um, many of them uh, meet Health Research Council guidelines and seek approval from the Health Research Council Ethics Committee, but um, all other researchers, so if you're not covered by universities or government agencies, um, there's nowhere to go to for ethics review, um, except uh, Martin Tolich's committee on which I've served, which is a pro bono committee servicing those researchers who are outside um, the purview of uh, otherwise any other research ethics frame. Um, so all of this means that any organisation with an ethics committee could be in the dock um, at the Waitangi Tribunal or face judicial review if some research, um, if Māori, any Māori took against um, some research and thought it breached the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Now, the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi are code for um, a presenter's idea of what the treaty should have meant that our society should be like. At the most basic, the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi are breached by the disparity between Māori and non-Māori mortality. So the question that comes to us out of all of that treaty risk is, how do we ensure research with Indigenous peoples is ethical so that Indigenous peoples and others do not feel like taking research from the organisations like universities to the Waitangi Tribunal for unethical research under the Treaty of Waitangi? So practically, how do we shape policy and practice of ethics committees to ensure that the research abides by those principles? Now, just to take you quickly through those principles, um, I don't have a slide on them because once you get into this, it's a bit like getting into um, trying to understand Hobbes Leviathan or uh, your federal arrangements um, in Australia. Um, but they're basically partnership, act of protection and redress. And the partnership one is the dominant idea for research ethics that research has to be done as partners with Māori, not on Māori, and we'll come back to that. So um, there's been several responses by institutions and wider scholars and research ethics to how do we ensure that research with Indigenous peoples is ethical. They, they tend to follow the dominant discourses about the Treaty of Waitangi and Māori reconciliation in New Zealand. So there's the legal side, um, where Māori great great strides in the early 1980s, and then statutes were put in with treaty clauses, and those have been, um, those have helped create a treaty jurisprudence um, that's now 30 to 40 years old. On the other hand, there's been work particularly within Māori um, research centres and by Māori scholars of anthropology and education, that we're looking for Māori understandings um, of 
and, and in some sense a rejection of Western understandings of research ethics and research and an attempt to find Māori um, ideas of that. Um, the legal risk is avoided, according to this legal view, the risk of um, or the risk to be managed by ethics committees is avoided by talking with all interested Māori parties. Um, that, as always, is hard for settler politics and its ethics committees um, and evaluating researchers and the research committees evaluating them. Um, but I, what I'd like to say about that is that's not a Māori problem. Um, and Māori here in New Zealand, we've worked really hard to shit home responsibility for it. Um, that, that it's the researcher's job to know who they're supposed to consult with. And that they don't know is actually a problem of their race relations. It's a problem of their um, lack of knowledge about a really important sector and population and community that for some reason they then want to work with. Um, so it's a, it's a really important point that I just want to make that at legally, um, though the legal view of research involving Māori might not be in some sense as far reaching as the sort of cultural view, there is still um, within it a really quite bright line test of that I'll come to later on. Um, it typically means in New Zealand research ethics that we have a Tangana Whenua group, um, a people of the land um, who are organized in an adjunct committee to the um, research ethics committee at an institution who run their eye over any research that may involve Māori and get to ask questions. And until that's been approved, it doesn't go through the research ethics um, the formal research committee. So there's almost a um, devolvement of Māori consultation to Māori by the um, Human Ethics Committee. Um, and just in case, what does consultation mean? There is um, a ratio on that in um, an old case from 1993, and it basically means you have to prove that you have listened appropriately and you have given the, the consultative party all of the possible material they might need. Um, now there's another view of Māori research ethics, and this is the view arising from Mataranga Māori or Māori knowledge to find a Māori-centered approach. This approach centers Māori knowledges and respect for them. And while the early work was essentialist, and I'm thinking here of the decolonizing method methodologies by Linda Smith, the seminal work in this field, it is now much more diverse. Um, um, and I just want to run you through because I think it's quite interesting, um, though reduced to this, it looks very much like mum and apple pie. What it is that um, these Kopapa Māori researchers, myself included, are looking for uh, for ethics committees to start looking for. Um, so there's Tino Longa Tanga, which is really about recognizing that the research should be creating. Māori organisations and individuals who can represent or are representing themselves, or at least supporting them to represent themselves. So how does it create autonomy? Um, then there's the recognising the legitimacy of Māori knowledge and custom. Um, and this can be really hard, um, particularly when you've got um, IP being asked for from the Māori community, um, which as you'll know is really starting to happen as Western medicine looks towards older um, remedies. Um, then there's, and this I think for me is really important because as a political philosopher, I'm much of an political and interesting political conflict. The point of Whakawhanaungatanga is recognising and respecting each other and getting to know each other and just sitting down and talking. I mean, it's even in Quentin Skinner's version of Hobbes that the point is that you just keep talking um, and then you get into the idea of nurturing people and as public servants worldwide say, two ears, one mouth. 
um, use them in proportion. And and this uh, this need to be generous um, and listen and and we'll see later be humble. I think is a really interesting um, addition to research ethics literature because those are the things that we know build trust and it's trust that researchers need to constantly build in their participants so that wider society will continue to keep on, on to be participants in research. Um, so research ethics today um, is a combination of the cultural and legal themes that I've been talking about. And the definitive statement for those who are interested, it's online, it's free, um, is the late Barry Smith's work with others on for the Health Research Council. It's a, a chunky 100-page pulling Maori, um, in the best sense of the word, to create a view um, of a set of continuums about working with Māori. Um, and if you think, I don't know if I can do left and right here, but what we're looking for is to move towards the red, the Belmont principles, for instance. Instead of having the problem arise from the academic or policy worlds, the problem that a researcher is looking at needs to be identified by the community at the very best of proper kaupapa Māori research or really, really highly um, really good research that involves the rest of the community. And then there's the researcher being or even coming from the community um, as, as um, a way of demonstrating that this research is embedded within the community. And then there's the idea that, and this brings up data sovereignty, that the research should support and be supported by the community and that they own the data and the results, um, rather than the research just helping the university researcher become um, a professor or the policy institution having a new way of working with that indigenous group. But in fact, it builds a self-determination and, and in the best cases, actually build the community builds the solutions themselves. Um, so, <laughs> The kind, to sum it all up, the research ethics review I've seen in New Zealand and hope is happening elsewhere concentrates on ensuring that Māori organisations and vigils are heard and seen and their opinions are sought and listened to. And this isn't a generic tick box exercise or, a, or through generic statements on historical wrongs and cultural beings, etc. Um, and certainly not about helping Māori, but it involves real meeting and real people talking about research. Some ask and suggest that it takes time, can't we just do the research? I say the risks of not doing the consultation, not sitting down and talking, are that you maybe stop a Māori organisation and never be able to come outside. New Zealand Māori community, as with the Aboriginal community, is small. Um, and if you have hurt Māori participants in the past, that's going to make your research all the harder. Um, I have an interesting story about that, about how it can also hurt the researcher. Even a Māori researcher, if they haven't got the community on side and work through the elders, um, in the case I'm thinking about, got named in Parliament as not doing a good job. Um, and so, my final point is this, it was Ronald Reagan who said the five scariest words in the English language from a government was I'm here to help you. Let's reframe that for me. The five scariest for me as an Indigenous reviewer is this research will help Māori because it's a global noun. It always means that they don't have relationships with Māori and the question of when will it help Māori is abstract, not concrete. Um, and so I suggest actually the real thing that we should be trying to find as research ethics committees, as researchers who are engaging empathetically, we should see evidence of them engaging empathetically with communities. Um, but that requires quite a bit of deep personal decolonization work for many people. You have to recognize Māori organizations as subjects. You have to be able to talk with them. Um, and you need to hop out of stereotypes and face participants and other indigenous peoples as people who are subjects and sovereign in their own right. Um, that leads me to what might be um, 
partly a hard point. If there are no re pre-existing relationships, why is the research being proposed? If Māori are excluded, excluded from the research, i.e. Pākehā paralysis, paralysis that Marvin Tollich points to, um, C.1. Um, all of this means that research ethics, in my view, is a site of reconciliation and renewal at best and exclusion at worst, and it means it's also highly contingent and highly politicised. But we mustn't be scared of that, because if we're doing our work well, we are building trust back with the Māori, um, with Māori populations and people. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I hope that that adds something to the conference um, and that just provides some food for thought. Kia ora. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, I don't know if we've got any questions. Can, uh, can the organisers see any questions? I can't actually see um, any. I've got a few, Andrew. I mean, one, one okay. not necessarily from the chat, but but Lindsay, look, uh, obviously in Australia we have About three minutes, Gordon. Sorry. Uh, surely, uh, in Australia we have a number of guidelines for research involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So we got the IATS as guidelines and um, um, other guidelines. Um, you, you only seem to have one set, and of course ours deals with with principles of things like respect and reciprocity. Do your guidelines similar? And um, if not, um, it, it, why not? Okay. Um, um, if not, why not? It's my favorite exam question. Um, the guidelines, we don't have more. I don't know if we have guidelines. We have a proliferation of um, the National Ethics Advisory Board. We have the Human the Health Research Council Advisory Board all got guidelines. I just got what I think are the best ones, the most comprehensive from a Māori organisation. Um, there are, they're quite deep and quite, um, and they can be read as quite prescriptive. Um, and I haven't gone through all the principles that they might propose. Um, but I people who know what they doing with research around Indigenous peoples just to buy them naturally. Mm -hmm. And the trouble I find is that if you don't know that, if you sit as a researcher saying, um, I'd like to work in this area, but I don't know how to do consultation, I don't know how to work with Indigenous peoples, um, quite often those guidelines don't really tell you practically why it is you should do that. Um, and the way that I suggest of managing it by risk via management of thinking in those terms um, seems to work with um, every the, when I was a research consultant for the ethics committee over here that um, scientists who were um, struggling with the idea that Māori had political um, power and they should be aware of that and that political power meant that they should have a say about how the research is conducted, and of course not why it should be conducted, um, meant that um, they could understand that and they immediately got that. And I think it's just a way of taking the research ethics out of um, this cultural story about respecting Māori worldviews by a story where we're having to um, feel guilty about how Māori or Indigenous peoples have been treated and instead deal with them as political equals um, so that we're taking away the power, power over and have trying to have power with. Yeah. Does that, hopefully that answers a little of the question. I think it does. And it also really, it's very consistent with the new IAXIS code, which is, was released a couple of weeks ago, where the code and, and accompanying guidelines capture a lot of what you've been saying. And the new code, in fact, focuses on four principles, Indigenous self-determination, Indigenous leadership, impact and value, and sustainability and accountability, which is and, and underpinned by the engagement that you're talking about, Lindsay. So there's so much consistency there. It's incredible, really. Yeah, yeah. I think that demonstrates that the sort of fourth world or um, Indigenous scholarship and, and, and Indigenous engagement are, are highly transferable around the world. Yeah. So thank you very much, Lindsay. For that.